So, uh, welcome to the July meeting of uh, our ALP2 project. Certainly, uh, you know, I think uh, we have a, a full agenda again. And uh, just to remind everyone that we're targeting a brain penetrant ALP2 inhibitor for the treatment of DITG. And, you know, uh, this slide I would like to show because there is a very dire unmet medical need to, to try to treat these children. And I think, uh, you know, we're taking pretty significant strides. Uh, with this effort to, to, to accomplish that. And, uh, you know, I think uh, the agenda today um, is, is going to be very interesting. I think, uh, you know, we've got a couple of um, presentations, one from uh, Javad Nazarian, and I'll introduce him uh, coming up. Jerome, as well, has some interesting data uh, that, that he's just generated, and Alexi, is also supposed to tell us about some of the RIPK2 profiling data uh, that, that he's gathered uh, with our compound. Uh, after that, we'll get into the standard, uh, uh, our standard project updates with Alex, Sue, David, McLeod, and I'll come in with a, a brief summary uh, for this month. And uh, and then you know if there's any uh, anything else that we should discuss, uh, we, there, there should be time at the end. Um, so as usual, I'll start with kind of action items from the previous meeting. Um, we had talked about sending compounds for, for brain exposure, and, and that was done, and we actually have results that uh, had come in just at the last meeting, and uh, uh, I've summarized those in a slide, and uh, I'll show those during my part of the presentation later this morning, but they are very promising, certainly for 2009. The uh, SIP testing... Uh, Ha has happened. The compounds were sent, they've been tested, and the results look good. I think Sue talked about a, a little bit about that at the last meeting, but um, basically of the compounds that we sent, there was really uh, no issues with respect to uh, SIP profiling against the major isoforms. Um, we talked about sending additional compounds to Alexi for the RIPK2 and MTT testing, and this is what I think Alexi's going to talk about today. Um, there was a follow-up from a, a meeting that we had at Charles River talking about how are we going to profile these compounds in vivo uh, moving forward, and there was some discussion about, you know, the original model in the DIPG007 cell line seemed to be, you know, uh, a reasonable place to start, and that was carried out by Chris Jones and, and Angel uh, Montero uh, Carcabosa. And so we wanted to organize a call with them and with Charles River to be able to discuss this model and, and discuss potential next steps to try to um, move that forward. That has happened. Mm -hmm. Alex organized that. It happened uh, last Friday. I was away. I missed it. I don't know if you wanted to give just a brief overview of, or, you know, maybe we can talk about it later. Uh, yeah, we can talk about it later. There was a, it was a good meeting. There was a lot of uh, ideas. It was more of a brainstorming meeting, and there's going to be some follow-up uh, over the next uh, over the next uh, week or so. Yeah. But it was, a, it was a lot of opportunities. Great. Um, we also talked about providing Jerome with some additional compounds for proliferation studies, as well as, you know, some of the uh, looking at the phosphosmad. Uh, and so I think he's got some of that data uh, to present uh, here today. Uh, we wanted to prioritize compounds for x-ray, uh, Jeff and the Davids and, and, and Sue certainly and Alex and John Fu and you know, certainly we prioritized 3007 which uh, is one of the literature compounds and uh, uh, from Blueprint which, which was extremely potent and, and, and looks quite uh, interesting. I think uh, there was another compound, 3003, as well. Uh, again, a, a literature compound from Novartis, uh, that one. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, Alex should have those compounds already. Um, Jerome, you were going to talk to Stanford about getting some other cell lines, and maybe you'll address that during your presentation. Uh, we wanted to bring the MDCK MDR1 assay online, and again, we're still close there. Uh, I haven't had an update from Ahmed since I returned from my vacation, but uh, I, I, I do believe that we are close to getting that online. And then finalizing the ALP2 database uh, internally here at OICR is still something that's ongoing. Um, we have uh, uh, we've made some progress on that, and I think, uh, again, we're getting close to having the uh, 
all, all of our ALP2 data in, in one place. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, I wanted to start off today's presentation just by reminding everyone what the lead profile is or what the lead profile was uh, that, that was presented uh, in the application form uh, for, for the grant that's supporting this work. Basically, we're looking for a molecule with uh, enzymatic potency against ALP2 in the 10 nanomolar range or less, ideally. Cell based potency less than 100 nanomolar and activity in the, against the DIPG cell lines kind of less than 500 nanomolar. We're looking for selectivity, especially against ALP5 of about 500 fold. Now, 500 fold is, is I think, pretty aggressive. <laughs> I'm not sure that we'll be able to achieve that, especially in the cell-based assays, but I think, you know, generating a sufficient window uh, against the, these kinases is, is something that we should target. And, you know, we can discuss that as we move forward, uh, what, that real, what that number should really be. Uh, the kinase selectivity, no relevant kinases, more than 50% at one micromolar. Um, and that was in the DiscoverX panel, but you know, I'll show you today that... We have some RBC data uh, that, that, that looks quite good. Um, in vitro ADV, basically, you know, good overall stability and permeability. Uh, we want a soluble compound, one that doesn't inhibit SIP or HERB, and uh, uh, it's free of AIMS. We want something with good bioavailability, uh, shows good exposure in the brain, and uh, is able to maintain a... Uh, a unbound brain concentration that's uh, at least threefold above the DIPGCC50 uh, for a reasonable amount of time. Uh, you want to see efficacy in a mouse tumor uh, xenograft model, either reduction in tumor volume or an increase in survival. And I think you know we're ready to to start looking at some compounds with some of these models now. Especially, I think M4K 2009 is 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 emerging as as our front runner and a, really a potential candidate. So, I think we've got some exciting data to show today that, uh, that, that we'll um, uh, talk about that further. Obviously, we want a, a good therapeutic index with no, ther with no toxicity. We do want to see an impact on the downstream markers of, of ALP2 uh, inhibition, the phosphosmad, the ID1 expression, uh, et cetera. And uh, there was some talk about a peripheral biomarker as well. So. Uh, I wanted to remind everyone of what these these parameters are that, that we're targeting uh, with this uh, with this series of molecules, and uh, you know I think we've got some some interesting data to show again today. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Javad Nazarian. Uh, Javad is an investigator at the, the Center for Genetic Medicine uh, in Washington. He's an, also an assistant uh, professor at the George Washington U. He's a scientific director of the Brain Tumor Institute um, uh, at the Children's uh, National Health System in, in Washington, and he's a co-chair of the Children's Brain Tumor Tissue Consortium Scientific Committee. And I came across Javad's name on the internet looking at uh, the DIPG uh, consortium that he's a part of um, that's devoted to uh, kind of uh, capturing and characterizing DIPG samples and generating models. And I think Javad will tell us more about this, but really he's dev devoted his career to understanding brain tumors, to especially you know, DIPG. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really delighted to have him here today as a, as a guest speaker to, uh, to tell us more about the work that, that is ongoing uh, at, at his institute. Um, so with that, Javad, I can tr make you a uh, presenter. Um, Let me know when you can see my screen, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you can? Yeah, yeah. I just need to make you a uh, presenter, which I'm trying to do here. Or. Oh, I don't have a remote view. Hold on here. Uh, I think if you go back to presentation. What's that? Go back to presentation. Okay. No. 
Sorry, guys. It's been, uh, I was away for on vacation for a little while, and I seem to have lost all of my IT sense. Uh, let me see if I can. I should just be able to right click on this. Wait about make make host? Oh, make host, yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah. We can do that. Yeah. All right. You might have to make me host again there, Javad. Uh, okay. Um, so you should be able to share your screen there now, Javad. Okay. If not, then what I'm going to do is go. Uh, yeah, uh, there you okay. go. Got it. Can okay. we see it? Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah, great. Jeff, thank you very much for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to present our work and also potential for the collaborations. At Children's National, we have active research areas which include mesoblastomas, low grade gliomas, NF. Um, which is led by our, our colleague, Dr. Miriam Bornhorst, a clinical geneticist who's here today, and DIPG. I will just focus on DIPG and some of the brain tumors of the work that we have done. This is the biorepository that we have developed at Children's National. And you can see over time, we have started from 12 samples and we've grown over 1,200 specimens. These are 12, sorry, 1,200 patient samples that we have banked, which really includes over 5,000 biospecimens, anything from the tumor, healthy tissue, um, CSF, plasma, urine that has been banked, but it's over 1,300 patients that has been banked at Turization. And these are really well annotated with clinical annotations. This is the subtypes of the, the, the samples that we have collected and have banked. Um, which again is being done by two of our colleagues here, Madhuri and Eshini, who are also here in the presentation. The, the majority of the samples include astrocytomas, but again, you can see that the biobank um, includes CSF, frozen tissue, blood, FFP, TMA, and urine, which would be great if you want to look at some of the biomarkers that are associated with the tumor. The DIPG, you know, everyone here knows about the DIPG. The recent data has shown HTVR, K27M to be mainly midline, H3G34, RV to be cortical. There are a subset of mutations, including TP53, that are shared by midline gliomas as well as, as, well as cortical samples. And we have been trying to map the heterogeneity and homogeneity of these mutations across the brain. This is the recent data, again, uh, by Chris Jones that you're collaborating with, stressing the specificity of mutations to different anatomical location, different zip codes within the brain region that we have to be careful about and we have to monitor with regards to the tumor. And we know that mutation types are age associated and they do have an impact on the overall survival of the patient. ACVR, which is the target here, is mainly associated with H31, uh, which has a high, which has the lowest, one of the lowest age range between our patients. We have looked into heterogeneity of the patients. We want to know if the tumor, when it metastasizes from the primary site, does it, does it change its mutation profile? Because it's really important to know this. If we get to the point that we can um, treat effectively, treat the primary mutation, we should be able to also effectively treat the metastatic tumor. But also for DIPGs, there are currently there are a few clinical trials nationally and internationally that we are involved with that they are taking biopsies from tumor core. And the question has been whether the tumor core represents the the, the, the tumor as in, in its full form, meaning that that's also metastatic sites do, have, do harbor mutations that have been initially identified in the tumor core. This is the work that was done by our student, Eshini. We do have a very active post-mortem autopsy collection at Children's. 
We collect uh, postmortem whole brain from patients who die from brain tumors. Our emphasis is on DIPG, but we collect from any patient who, whose family wants to donate. We take the whole brain, we collect samples throughout the brain, and this is based on the MRI. Uh, the last MRI that the patient has had indications of where the tumor could be, or based on the gross analysis of the, of the tumor when we are cutting through the brain. And again, our colleagues, physicians here are on board who can help us during the autopsy to identify potential metastatic sites that were not previously identified by the, uh, by the MRI. This is the work that we have done. So we, we collect whole sections, the sagittal section of the brain, precisely to look at metastatic sites. Um, this is an example of what was done by a pathologist, and typically the areas that the pathologist deems normal, they end up to be to harbor mutant uh, cells, and this is done by histology. So again, if you show a section of a frontal lobe, for example, to a pathologist, they often um, categorize that, that section as normal, but we have seen if you do staining for histone mutation, you can actually see 3 to 4% of the cells being mutant, meaning that the tumor has evaded and has escaped the brain stem very early on and has, um, has housed in the different parts of the region. This is the work that was done by Eshin in our lab. She has taken up to 20 different uh, samples throughout the brain of different anatomical locations of the brain uh, of nine patients. We have now expanded this to 22 patients. This is the work that we haven't published yet. So we've done mutation analysis uh, using targeted mutation screening or whole genome or exome screening, histopathology, methylation, and RNA profiling. And again, the, the idea is that what is the degree of heterogeneity and homogeneity? And you probably know this, there, there, are, two different, there are two different distinct descriptions of homogeneity versus heterogeneity. So the class of thought that I register to more often is that the, the, these tumors are mainly homogeneous, meaning that the driver mutations that are found in the brain stem are always, almost always detected in the metastatic sites. So the class of thought that I understand um, as well is the work done by Chris Jones that these tumors are heterogeneous, meaning that the, the mutation profile of a, of a metastatic tumor is very different from the initial site, which is also correct. But if you look at the mutations that are actionable, that are driver mutations, they're always present. In, in the context of actionable mutation, these tumors are homogeneous. In the context of tumor profile, they're heterogeneous. And I will also show some data on heterogeneity of these tumors. So we have shown that the majority of these patients do have metastasis, different parts of the brain. Cerebellum tends to be the area that is hit first. And we have defined the heterogeneity by bioinformatic analysis of the tumor, primary tumor versus the metastatic one. H3F3A histone mutation is almost always detected in the tumor, meaning that is potentially the initial insult that the tumor has. The PPM1D and P53, these are mutually exclusive. We have had one case where you could actually detect both P53 and uh, PPM1D up front, meaning prior to any treatment in a biopsy case, but at, at uh, post-treatment and also at postmortem, you almost all, never see the combination of PPM1D and TP53. And depending on what mutations the tumor cells pick, they'll decide which pathway they will go down. And we have defined this in the context of TP53, ATRX, and H3F3A, which is the work that we published a few years ago. In order to make the data and the specimens that we have collected to make it clinically relevant, we have been working with the PNOC, Pacific Pediatric Neuroncology Consortium. We are their research arm. The PNOC has launched um, a clinical trial. Sorry, let me go back. Pacific Pediatric Neuroncology uh, Consortium that has launched 
uh, clinical trials for DIPGs. They do take biopsies of the patients up front at diagnosis. There is a discussion on re-biopsying the patients post-treatment for several reasons. One is to assess tumor response post-treatment. And the second reason is really to look into some of the questions that you are asking as far as how much of the medication is getting into the tumor, doing some analysis of the freshly biopsied tumor post-treatment and analyze the PK and also the concentration of a particular drug in the tumor. We also work with Children's Brain Tumor Tissue Consortium, which is it's really one of the largest consortia that is collecting samples from all of pediatric brain tumors. This is not a dead bank. What I call, what I mean by a dead bank is a, is a, is a freezer full of tissue, what CBTCC, and what we have created is a live and a, and a biologically relevant biobank where, where the, bio, the surgical biopsies, the postmortem samples are converted into live cells in DMSO or mouse models, and they have preserved. So CBTCC has preserved this, but more importantly, all of the models that are created are fully characterized by um, mRNA profiling, whole genome profiling, and methylation profiling. This is a, an overview of, of all of the genomic data that currently exists at the CBTCC. CBTCC is well incorporated and connected to all of the adult genomic data, which will house over 25,000 genome by the end of this year. So you could ask a question of a particular mutation, for example, for ACVR. Is it, is it also pre present in other, pediatric, in other adult tumors? And if it is, and if there has been a clinical trial for that particular mutation, you can extract the data and you can look at the data. We have, through CBTCC, we have launched a project, Open DIPG, where, where we are housing all of the DIPG data, anything that has been published under one roof. Again, members of CBTCC and even people, companies and um, researchers who are not members of CBTCC, they can put in an application and have access to all of the data. The data, this, again, this will be released by later this year. Um, so far, we have over 800 subjects. These are midline gliomas, thalamic and DIPG patients that we have, uh, we have uh, collected under, again, one platform where you can download the data, you can look at analyzed data, and these bioinformatics uh, support also on the, on the web where the data are housed that one can do bioinformatic analysis of this. Working with PNAC and CBTTC, we have, we try, this, is a, um, sorry, this is a slide that shows the the profiling of, the, of these samples that you can see, they have H31 mutations, H33 and uh, H3K2, H3G34 and H3K27M, as well as wild type. And again, this is an initial characterization of our open DIPG profile. I mentioned too that we work with PNOC. They have initiated a biopsy that I mentioned. This is the schema that they run for uh, PNOC003. On the left, you can see the correlative studies for xenograft development, the tDNA sequencing tumors, DNA, and also whole genome sequencing. Our lab is highly involved with this segment of the correlative studies, and we have developed um, up to 12 different xenograft models and 15 cell lines by working with PINA. We develop xenograft cell lines, as you can see, the mouse models truly represent the human model. These are um, nude mice that are injected at P21, and the first engraftment will take about eight months. The second and the third, it will be reduced to about six to seven months. This is the profile of all of the patients that have been involved in the PNOC trial. This is the PNOC feasibility trial that was launched, and again, for all of these patients, we have collected cells in DMSO, and for a good number of them, we have been able to develop cell lines. We have, this is the genomic profile of all of the patients. And one thing that I spoke with Jeff before was that going forward with your inhibitor, alx inhibitor, it would be really important to look at what is the DIPG cell lines that you're working with. 
just look at this slide and look at the, the difference in partner mutations of histone partner mutations. I I highly I would highly doubt that your drug would behave equally in all of the different cell lines that you're working with. You have to know the genome profile, and if your drug doesn't work, or if you would require a higher molarity to work in particular cell line, I would I would I would expect for you to know the the genome profile such that you would be informed of why a drug is working and why it's not working. Right, we're already seeing uh, that 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 you know we see variable responses mm -hmm. across the, the cell lines that Jerome has looked at so far, anyway. So, um, right, which is so which is not that surprising, I, right? Yeah. Sure. So, a highly hypomethylated genome would behave very differently. And one of the mistakes that people make typically for DIPG research, we look at um, um, cell death, and we always look at the kill curve. This is a hypomethylated genome. If a drug is working, other than if it's killing a cell, the first thing that I would expect is that you would reduce proliferation, and then you would look at cell, you would, you would try to monitor cell death. If a drug has a high toxicity and is killing the cells, then I would be suspicious of the potential side effects and damage that it could do to the healthy cell. So it would be important to perhaps even monitor the epigenomic of the cells that are treated with your drug and see if you're changing any, if you're stabilizing the epigenetic status of the cells and you're making the genes more um, normally methylated. This is, again, this is a very good representation of whether the IPGs are high, uh, homogeneous or heterogeneous. This is a patient, this is the uh, circus plot showing the genomic aberration at diagnosis, the primary cell genome analysis. This is the progression where a biopsy was taken of the patient. And you can see the genome is, is shifting and is, is evolving. And if you look at that post-mortem, you, you have a beautiful array of different genomic aberrations. So if a whole brain was obtained by my laboratory and different pieces of the brain were sent to Oren, to Michelle, to Xiaonan, we would all develop different cell types, cell lines which would have potentially different genomic landscape. And we should be able, every time we deal with, we work with the cell line of the IPG, we have to have the genome map that we can test. We characterize these cells, we culture them, and we look at the, the expression of the proteins that we knew um, that they were supposed to be overexpressed by, by the genome analysis that we have done. And we do in vitro testing, as you have shown for many of uh, the targets that we have, their, their research that we have interest in internally. We work with industry as well as other collaborators to test their drugs and our models. We've also worked very closely with the neurosurgeons who do CED, convection enhanced delivery, by putting a direct uh, subcutaneous pump into the mouse brain. For many of the drugs that we administer, we don't know if it even crosses the blood brain barrier, and if it does, do we achieve the right volume and the right concentration? This way, we just put the drug in the brain stem directly into the tumor bearing mouse, and we test. Efficacy. If it shows efficacy, then we will go out and, and test to do by administration. We have shown that we get a very good distribution of the drugs, as shown in the lower left panel with distribution of the uh, blue dye. But more importantly, for many of the drugs, including um, newly um, identified drugs that show really good in good in vitro data, the problem is that we don't know if it crosses the blood brain barrier. Very often, we feed these drugs to mice and we take the tumor and analyze it, which is the work that you're also doing. The problem is that we can't really monitor time-wise, over time, the drug metabolism and the drug concentration. To answer this, we have developed an in vivo mouse model. This is a non-tumor bearing mouse that has a probe, a macrodialysis sitting in the brainstem. Again, this work was done by one of our neuro, um, neurosurgery fellows. The probe has two lines. The blue line is an inlet, and the, uh, the clear one is an outlet. 
artificial CSF is pumped into the brainstem and washed out, and we can monitor this, collect this over time. This is a schema that shows how it works. The mouse is sitting in a, in a special design bowl where it is living and you can monitor by feeding the drug and analyzing the analyte and how it comes out. This is the end of the probe, how the drug, how the artificial CSF is perfused and the washout is analyzed. The pores on the membrane can be pre-designed and pre-selected based on the particular analyte that is of interest. And again, this model would be really good to test a couple of questions of when the drug gets in, how much of it gets in, how long does it stay, what does it take, how long does it, what is the half-life of the drug within the microenvironment of the brain. And again, we have this living and surviving. We're also involved in liquid biopsy. This is work that's been done by Eshini. We've done this in human. Um, I, I will go through this really quickly where we can actually take the plasma from a patient and look at the wild type versus mutant. This is histone 3. We've done this for SVR, PPM1D, and uh, H3, H31 and H33. And we have shown this to be clinically relevant. We have done this in the clinic for one of our patients who had a brain tumor that was not operated and we could actually detect this the mutation from using CSF. Actually, has shown this to be clinically relevant. Again, this is the concentration of the histone mutation and we can do this for ACVR, as I mentioned. In the plasma, the concentration drops after radiation, stays low during the first phase of treatment, spikes between the two phases and drops after the second phase of the treatment. This is very much uh, correlative with the, with the MRI finding that the, the concentration of the uh, ctDNA drops in the plasma and, and, and increases post-treatment, which is very much, goes very much hand in hand with the MRI finding. And that was my last slide. So we have the, the, the pre models that we have the cell lines that we have, the mouse models, and the, the models for testing drug penetration um, would be, I think, would be a good resource for your um, team to, to take advantage of. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that, Javad. Um, you showed one slide where you, you kind of summarized uh, some of the patient samples that you have, and I think I, I mean, it went pretty quick, but right? I think I only saw one that had the ACBR1 mutation. Is that true? No, we have uh, for the cell lines. Yeah. No, we have more than one that has ACVR mutations. Right? It was back one more. Right. It was back one more. Yeah. Are you this are you looking at this one? Yeah. No. So, so no, these are the these are the patients that are um, enrolled in the feasibility trial in the PNOC trial in the PNOC ah. feasibility trial. Okay. Right. But we do have more, we have multiple cell lines that do have a CVR mutation. And then we can look at those and give you the information. But then the most important thing is that all of our cell lines have been fully characterized. We have whole genome sequencing of them. We have methylation profiling and um, we have an assessment of how long it would take for them to develop in vivo. Uh, that's great. And, you know, can you, do you have any, any sense of how many cell lines you have with the ACVR1 mutations and, and which mutations they are. I mean, presumably the 206, the 328B, but. Right, I can send you a list after this call today. Very great. Okay, that'd be fantastic, yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's great, Javad. Um, anyone yeah. else have any, any questions for Javad? Actually, uh, I, when you are doing the live mouse monitoring, do you uh, collect the CSF and do mass spec? Like, what do you do? You go for um, uh, right. We do mass spec. We do mass spec. So the first key here is to have a mass spec that can detect your particular drug. Mm -hmm. Typically, if they're not soluble, it's harder to get them to fly with the mass spec. But we have a team that we send them the drug first, and once they develop the QCs, and once they show us that they can detect a very low amount of the drug, then we will start uh, doing the in vivo testing. So the, the mass spec parameters are the, are, are the key for this analysis. Okay, got it. Thank you. 
<clears throat> okay, fantastic. Any other questions for Javad? Okay, thanks so much. Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. you get host back? Yeah, I think so. Uh, if you take a look at the ball, reclaim host. Okay, uh, what I want to do now is share. Um, While well, you're doing that, Javad, uh, perhaps Jeff and I can find a time early next week just to have a quick call with you and talk about uh, possibly how we would work together going forward. Sure, that would be fantastic. Great. Okay. Awesome. I'll reach out. I'll reach out to you uh, after this call. We'll find a nice time to that works for next week. That's okay. Sure, thank you. Alexi, do you would you prefer to have control? Uh, uh, just, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I can uh, advance your slides for you, or or I can pass you control. It's up, really up to you. Well, I actually want to advance my slides because it's probably easier that way. Okay, so okay. Can you go to slide number three. Actually, probably. All right. Okay. So, so so actually, if you advance it one more stool. There is a yeah. All right. So so what uh, my group as well together with Greg Cooney's lab are doing are trying to characterize a new class of RIG2 inhibitors. Our primary interest is in uh, RIG2 and its involvement in various inflammatory conditions. Uh, so we started from this compound called LDN two one four one one seven that all you are obviously familiar with. And one thing to point out is that in the original screen of this compound, it did inhibit RIP2 quite well, 15 animal ICP and assay, which was generally on par with the ALK family. So can you move to the next slide? So one strategy, and these are some of the slides that Greg showed you in the previous, in one of the previous meetings. But bottom line is we were looking for ways to both increase the potency of this molecule against RIP2 as well as maybe increase the selectivity for RIP2. So we focused on sort of the hybrid strategy, looking for additional molecules that are inhibiting RIP2 and at the same time might have uh, some sort of, you know, so, so that we can take a piece of that molecule and maybe put it on the LDN compound to improve selectivity. So one compound class that sort of came across in this sort of screening approach is, is a sort of a series of uh, molecules called glue-out inhibitors, the inhibitors that displace the alpha-C helix on the right. Um, and these molecules, you know, typically are characterized, there's a series of them, mostly BRAF inhibitors, as well as there are some EGFR inhibitors. They have the sulfonamide moiety that interacts with the DFG motif. And then the group past the sulfonamide sort of pushes the opposite helix out. So the molecule, there are several molecules of this class that actually were found to inhibit RIP2 in the different Kinome scan databases. We're using, for example, this database that is publicly available from Harvard Medical School called LINKS. And can you go to the next slide? And then basically uh, the idea was through modeling, we found that there is a nice overlap between the BRAF inhibitor and LDN compound, and we can attach the sulfonamide moiety to to a central position, most likely, of the LDN compound and see whether that will improve the selectivity. So we build a project based on that. Can you move to the next slide? Uh, and, you know, we, that generated a series of molecules that, again, Greg described previously, uh, and I just want to revisit very quickly, uh, that are called CSLP compounds. We've generated probably about 50 analogs. In the course of sort of making these molecules, we actually kind of struggled trying to um, really develop selectivity for it to versus LK2 to some extent. But then more recently with some of the new compounds, I think sort of things are starting to come into focus. Uh, so here you can see 
you know, probably a couple of things that are worth noting with respect to RIP2, the compound on the top was our original starting point, LDN compound, it has about 15 animal IC50 against RIP2. Uh, so one direction that Greg mentioned, so addition of the sulfonamide moiety in vitro, initially it didn't really seem to make a huge difference. Uh, so that was a bit disappointing, but I'll show you later that it's done a huge difference for the cellular activity. One direction that emerged from this initial study for LK2, on the other hand, was adding a large uh, aromatic group after the sulfonamide, the compound like CSLP24, that resulted in very robust activity against LK2 and limited activity against root 2 Can you move to the next slide? Uh, from there, again, we sort of we sort of try to understand what is driving the cell activity. We're doing both RIP2 assays and LK2 assays. LK2 assays were done by reaction biology. Uh, so one compound that attracted our interest, for example, was the CSLP31, which had the methyl group in the central R2 position. And that molecule lost affinity towards RIP2 and uh, had a decent affinity towards LK2 which sort of initially suggested that this R2 position in LK2 should be potentially hydrophobic. Uh, and then CSLP18 was our lead compound that actually showed cell activity for it too. And there, initially, we thought that the reason it's selective is, again, this R2 position, which is a methoxy group instead of methyl. But nowadays, it sort of looks more and more like the real difference is actually R1 position and this proton in this position because LK2 cannot tolerate anything that is actually small or polar next to the gatekeeper. Can you move to the next slide? And so, you know, right now we, we sort of operate with two lead compounds for the RIP2 series. We call them CSLP43 and 37. Uh, they contain either the methoxy group or fluorine in R1 position. Uh, they have methoxy group in the R2 position, and they have the uh, propyl sulfonamide in the R3 position. We found that all the molecules that display good cellular activity had to have uh, amine attached to the central pyridine ring. Without it, we were losing activity in the cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, so, so that's kind of where the starting point was for the RIP2 project. We're testing CSLP37 very actively in mice right now. We've just finished the PK study where some of the functional assays in one of the animal models, the inflammatory animal model. So that's all ongoing and actually showing really nice activity. But at the same time, we sort of want to expand and see what we can get with respect to some of the new compounds that are being generated for LK2 and how selected they will be for LK2 versus RIP2. Now, before we leave the slide, one thing I wanted to point out is that, again, comparing CSLP43 and 37, uh, this molecule displays roughly comparable affinity towards RIP2, but there is a big difference in LK2. And again, it is primarily driven by the small R1 group that is really not optimal for LK2. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, if you have the basically nothing in R1 position, then you lose even more affinity towards LK2. Can we move to the next slide? All right, so, so one, another thing that I wanted to point out is in case of RIP2, in inhibition of RIP2 is just sort of part of the story. We sort of have a story together with Alex and Mats uh, Gerd Hansen's group, which is, has been accepted and will be coming out. But these inhibitors, actually, even though they're catalytic inhibitors, they're type 1 inhibitors, roughly. The reason they inhibit signal in the cells is primarily because they disrupt ubiquitination of RIP2. And so, you know, there is a definitely a disconnect between the catalytic IC50, let's say, in the in vitro assays for these inhibitors and the ability of these inhibitors to work in the cells. 
So the two best molecules that we have, 37 and 43, are not tremendously remarkable in terms of their in vitro affinity, but at the same time, they have very nice activity in the cells. And so, you know, I'm not sure to which extent, I'm guessing that for LK2, it is sort of a more canonical kinase pathway where you inhibit the catalytic activity and you get the functional readout. For RIP2, it is not. So in, in some cases, inhibition of catalytic activity of RIP2 does not translate into a good cellular activity. So for RIP2 specifically, we sort of need to really have the right combination of uh, groups in R1, R2, and R3 positions, uh, preferably, you know, methoxy groups in, in R1 and R2 are much preferred. Uh, in R3 position for RIP2, it's really critical for high, affinity, high activity in the cells. Without this sulfonamide, uh, we are losing a lot of activity. You can see the compound CSLP55, for example, which displays relatively poor cellular activity, even though it displays a good inhibition of RIP2. And also this X group is, also, is critical for RIP2, the amine, analogs were active, and the methyl analogs uh, displayed very poor micromolar activity in the cells. And there seems to be three, just from this slide, three significant differences from LK2. First of all, R1 group, which in RIP2 can be very small and hydrophilic, and relatively hydrophilic, but this is definitely not tolerated for LK2, where the group has to be well, methoxy seems to be optimal, uh, or at least, you know, it should be bulky. Then there is a difference in R2 position, sort of, but that's a little less clear. It seems like methyl is preferred there for LK2 and uh, potentially hydrogen bond uh, acceptor might be preferred for A2. And then in R3, again, the bulky group significantly favors aromatic group, at least, is significantly favored for LK2, but from what I've seen thus far, it's not really clear that sulfonamide is really doing anything for LK2, whereas for RIP2, it's critical. And then finally, the X position, that's interesting because we, again, didn't really get good activity against RIP2 in the cells unless X was amine. And that didn't seem to be a requirement for LK2, right? So even yeah, though yeah. these two kinases seem to be very similar and sort of on the surface, everything looked very similar and sort of the activities of the compounds tracked quite well together, there are actually significant differences between those two kinases that can be exploited. So if you go to the next slide. So we actually, so, so Alex and Jeff sent us, sent us uh, a number of sort of initial molecules that have been developed. And, you know, we just wanted to sort of see some of the additional SR. Primarily this methyl group attached to the central ring. We've never tested it before. We didn't know what it would do. We had the 209, which, you know, from what I heard is sort of one of the lead compounds, very promising against the lead. Uh, there was a 45, 2045, which was actually quite selective for LK2 among, uh, versus LK5. <coughs> also looked interesting. And then I was actually curious about this molecule, 2053, because it has fluorine in the central R2 position, uh, as opposed to, we've never actually tested this particular combination. Can you go to the next slide? So the results were actually very interesting. First of all, you know, I want to point out that 2045, is not inhibitory versus RIP2. This is a cellular assay in the top and on the bottom is the RIP2 kinase assay. So this molecule has a very low activity against RIP2. So even though this part of the molecule appears to, well, is supposed to be solvent exposed, right? It um, seems to actually really dictate the cell activity quite a bit. And the isopropyl group seems to be highly, highly sort of preferred for ALK2. 
Now, obviously, there could be other changes that can be made in that position, which you know might change the affinity and selectivity curve. And uh, on the other hand, two zero zero nine is you know is not as selective. It has higher activity against root two, although it is still you know relatively reduced. Okay. On the other hand, uh, the two zero five three with the fluorine in the middle right here actually has a very nice activity against root two, uh, and. For the moment, as I mentioned, we've never really seen a good activity in the RIP2 cellular assays with any compounds which did not contain sulfonamide in the R3 position. And this was the first molecule that actually displayed 56 nanomolar IC50 in the cellular assay, which was great. Hmm. Also, I wanted to point out that basically all the molecules with this methyl group right here in the, attached to the central ring displayed very poor affinity against root 2. So um, moving on to the next set of compounds. Uh, so we, Jeff sent us, sent us uh, uh, four additional analogs, which basically asked a simple question, because we've never tested the molecule without any substitution in the central ring. We were curious whether we're misinterpreting the role of the amine. Maybe it's not really required. Maybe it's not as bad as methyl. And then, you know, we also looked at some of the analogs with the methyl group here with just two methyl group, uh, methoxy groups instead of three, as well as with no substituent in the R1 position. And the data was, again, kind of interesting because it turned out that this molecule, 1064, 1062, which basically does not have amine, attached to the central ring or metal, uh, displays quite decent activity in the cells, which is on par with our previously used uh, analog, which contains an amino group. And then the methyl was actually bad, as expected. So what that tells us is that, you know, this amine, which we thought is basically forming a hydrogen bond to the hinge, quite possibly is not doing that. And the reason what is really critical for it too is potentially the electron density on the central ring. And by, for example, attaching methyl group, that basically completely kills the activity of the molecule. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think it probably still, the, the amine is probably still making a hydrogen bond to the hinge, but like maybe just doesn't contribute as much as you thought it did. Well, I mean, at this point, we don't see any sort of positive contribution necessarily of the amine at all. And I mean, that's right. sort of an important thing for us because we're also looking for molecules that will be BBB permeable. So removing that amine was always sort of one of the goals of ours. And mm -hmm. so that's why we introduced methyl instead. But uh, again, it looks like we just don't need either one of them. Right, yeah, that's On good. that hand, we might sort of, so going to the last slide, uh, so, you know, again, there are actually quite significant differences, as it turns out, between uh, RIP2 and LK2, which probably might sort of expand to other kinases as well. I mean, there are differences in both, R, in all three, R1, R2, and R3 positions. It seems like there is a water molecule most likely between the R2 position and the LPC helix. And most likely we can exploit that for it too. But it doesn't look like, uh, well, it looks like that position in LK2 is much more hydrophobic. In our one position, it's clear that LK2, at least based on the compounds that we've seen, that uh, LK2 pocket is, again, larger and more hydrophobic. It looks like R3, LK2, you know, really prefers an aromatic group, potentially with a spacer, but sulfonamide itself might not really be required. Then this difference between in the X position, it seems like for LK2, methyl in that position was well tolerated and the compounds with the methyl in X were active, whereas for RIP2, this is absolutely not, you know, not good. 
And the methyl on the other in the other position, in the Y position, is okay for LK2, but we probably need an electron withdrawing group there for it too. So it looks like the uh, central ring is very different. The way the central ring binds to the hinge in LK2 and RIP2 is probably quite different. And then mm -hmm. lastly, you know, this, um, you know, group attached to the piperazine, uh, I think that's very important as well, as it turns out, it really modulates the cell activity. The isopropyl seems to be highly prefer preferred for LK2. And in addition, you know, I think there, there, there should be some sort of a modification here because it will eliminate the hydrogen bond donor. Uh, so that's kind of where things stand right now. Uh, that, that's great. Uh, Alexi, can I ask uh, how, where you, how, where this data came from, the RIPK2 IC50? That's a cellular, that's an in vitro assay. It's an in vitro assay that you ran internally, or was that yeah. at RBC? Yeah, that's our RIP2 assay. Okay. Interesting. It's because, uh, you know, we sent to M4K 2009 for a full kinome profiling at RBC, and uh, interestingly enough, RIPK2 did not come up as a, as yes. a hit. We had, we had it tested at one, one micromolar, mm -hmm. and it, it, there was no inhibition at all. So. Yeah, that's something that we've known about, and I actually forgot about it. But for some reason, for some really weird reason, RBC screen, or RBC actually assay, does not accurately measure activity of CSLP compounds or LDN compounds against RIP2. I mean, we've done this many times, both in cells and binding to RIP2 in the cells, in inhibiting RIP2 signaling in the cells, and we're quite confident that our assay is accurately sort of measuring activity against RIP2. Yeah. But at the same time, basically none of the LDN compounds display good activity against RIP2 in the reaction biology assay. I don't know why. Right. This is very busy. Yeah. But okay, any, anyway, I think it's something we can follow up on. And, you know, um, I'll touch, maybe I'll touch again on that when I, when I show the, the, the results of that kind of profiling. Yeah. Um, you know, so one more thing that I want to mention. So, you know, I think we would like to test some additional molecules and, uh, you know, we can do this sort of formulate the list offline later on. But um, in addition, we can do, as I mentioned, I think last time, certainly viability, sort of general viability testing for the yeah. molecules. We haven't started it, but, you know, so as you develop the sort of the panel of molecules that you are interested in, you know, just yeah, no, absolutely. I think you'll see again that you know M4K 2009 is probably our lead molecule. So generating as much data around that as we can, I think, would be interesting. Yeah. yeah so we can definitely test, um, you know, just general viability. That'd be great. Yeah. Phone problems. Great. Thanks. I have a question. How do we measure uh, the residence time on nano bread? Uh, well, that's kind of a tricky assay. So we developed an anabrat assay for it too, right? Not developed, but adapted. And so basically the way it's done is we add the inhibitor to the cells, uh, incubate for about two hours, and then we remove the inhibitor. And at the same time, add the probe. And by sort of the timing of the probe binding to the Chinese, you estimate the half-life of the inhibitor binding. Okay, we should probably move on because I think we're uh, getting a little behind in our agenda and, you know, we do have some time uh, that's available, uh, but... Uh, okay. okay, so I'll just give you guys a little update on what we've been doing with um, testing some of your compounds on the uh, IPG cell line. Uh, following up from last time, so the three cell lines we've been testing so far are um, the IPG6, um, uh, 4, 6, and 21, which were obtained from, from Stanford, and these are their general characteristics here. So the IPG4 and 21 are ACBR1 mutant, and 6 is not. Um, and uh, it was interesting when this meeting was uh, posted online, then 
and Chris Jones reached out to me uh, telling me that their DIPG4 lines didn't grow nearly as well as, as ours. So, uh, but we, we verified the, the right thing. Um, and actually, we're going to send them some, some of those cells. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, following up with what uh, Jabal was saying earlier, these cell lines can be quite heterogeneous. Uh, the DIPG4 line that Semper sent me, um, they initially grew very poorly and then they treated them with hypoxia and then they started growing very well. Um, and so, you know, this might have selected for particularly aggressive, aggressive clones. So there might be some heterogeneity in those cell lines and also in the, in the batches that people have around the world. Um, so in these experiments, basically we place the cells on day one, then add a drug the next day and then Performed a, a simple uh, assay, which is like cell hydroglow, uh, to look at the effect on cell proliferation or, or survival. So this is the general profile of, uh, of the kind of the most interesting compounds, I guess, that, that were generated so far, um, and, you know, in this in this four days assay. Um, and uh, at, at the bottom here, I put the reference of what you would expect if you have a, a 100% cytostatic effect, which can uh, help in the interpretation of what it means in terms of where the curve goes down. Um, and so, so, so yeah, so it seems to me that most of these compounds likely have, uh, you know, largely cytostatic effect. And I'm, I'm going to show you some more data that, that supports that. Although, you know, if you look at M M4K uh, 2045, for example, then you, you reach a lower baseline. So this this might actually actively kill cells in some way. And in general, the DIPG, uh, the ACBR1 mutant cell lines have, uh, you know, better response than, than the ACBR1 non mutant cells. I think the DIPG6 one. This is just a table uh, showing you, like, a, a general summary of, uh, of uh, observed IC50 for the different, uh, the different cell lines. Uh, again, if you focus on uh, uh, 2009, which might be the most interesting compound, it seems to have like pretty interesting, uh, interesting value. So, um, of course, we were interested in uh, in looking at whether you know these compounds actually target um, BNP signaling, so so ACBR1. And to look at that, we've uh, uh, we've looked at the, you know, the effect of the compound on, on phosphorylation of SMAD. Um, we looked also at another compound, the 6201, which is a, a dual inhibitor of ACBR1 and, and MET1. So you can see, for example, the important compound, they don't target phosphor, but 6201 does. Um, and all of the compounds seem to target phosphor SMAT. Now, of course, um, you know, with the caveat that the loading control, at, at least in this gel, is not, is not perfect. So we're going to definitely repeat that. Um, I should also mention that the, in these cell lines, uh, we actually simulated them with DMP6. The reason for that is because in the initial experiment, we didn't see any possible SMAT signal. We didn't know if it was an antibody problem or, uh, or you know, a signaling uh, problem. And so uh, we repeated what simulating the cell. It still didn't work, but it did work with the new possible SMAT antibody that we got from, from the Netherlands. So we're going to repeat these experiments in non-simulated cells as well. This is the IPG4 cell, but we're also going to repeat that in other uh, the IPG21 uh, cell. So I see that you're doing it at IC70 of the individual compounds. Yeah. Will you be able to eventually generate curves as well as like IC50 curves? As well? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's just, you know, that would be much more cells and, and different positions. Right, yeah, yeah, it would be just for a handful of compounds. Yeah, sort of, yeah. So, so we, that would just tend to get a different first yeah. Yeah. Great. That's uh, and then we measured the effect of the compounds on uh, actually apoptosis, uh, measuring the proportion of an SN5 positive cell by flow cytometry. Uh, here you have some data 24 hour after drug exposure as well as 48 hour after drug exposure. Um, and you can see, so we see 201, that's a compound that we knew, we already knew induces apoptosis to some extent. This might be related to MEC inhibition. But you can see that the F4K compounds don't really induce any apoptosis, uh, at least not to the level of the 6201, except maybe uh, at 2045 and the FPG21. We also want to look at later time points. So we did that with the DIPG4, which is a 48 hour drug exposure. 
Uh, we wanted to do it for the IPC21. We've had a, a problem growing these cells recently because we changed the fire for one of the components of the medium, and that turned out that was not a good idea. Um, and it can take some time to get those cells restarted, but we're going to be able to do that. Um, yeah. So that would be broadly consistent with the compounds having a largely cytostatic effect in the, in the uh, our uh, ATP life experiment. Mm -hmm. And then we measured whether we actually uh, have any effect on, on target gene expression. So we uh, started looking at the, at the known canonical BMP target genes by D1, ID2, and ID3. And you can see all the compounds uh, robustly decrease the expression of ID1 and ID3. Not much of an effect on ID2. Uh, that's interesting. We also see this type of uh, phenomenon with E6201 on uh, primary glial cells from ACDR1 knock in mice. And uh, it, it might just be, so this, it's, it's interesting that we see that also in, in, uh, in patient cell lines. So it might just be that the regulation of that gene is, is different somehow, even though you know it's a really well described uh, DMP responsive gene. And it's even amplified. In some, uh, in a subset of the IPGs that are not ACDR1 mutants, right? So this could actually be a, I mean, one would predict might be a key effector of mutant ACDR1, but some, it might be a little more complicated than that. I mean, nevertheless, it seems like the compound actually inhibits some of the, some of the markets. So mm -hmm. it's promising. Yeah, that's good. And uh, I just wanted to finish by giving you a little update on uh, our efforts to generate xenograph models. So we inject NSG plus that whole candle day two with some uh, CIPG cells. Um, we, we did get some engraftment, it seems, of the IPG4 in one experiment, but in the second experiment, it didn't quite work. And this is something that we talked about with Chris Jones uh, that, and, and Michelle Manger as well, mm -hmm. as well. I was in Denver a couple of weeks ago. I had a chance to talk to them, and they, they told me as well that the IPG4 did not reliably engraft uh, in their hands. So. Um, we're also trying with the FPG21, but again, talking with Michelle and Chris, uh, to me, that might not work either. However, uh, we just got a new line from Stanford, the FPG36. Maybe I should, I should switch to FPG numbers instead of Roman numeral. Mm. But, uh, <laughs> they, uh, so Michelle told me that this cell line actually is xenograph. So this is an ACBR1 mutant cell line, uh, that, uh, that was just generated. So I, I got it and, um, uh, it's going to take some time to expand and, and get that uh, set up, but uh, that could be uh, nice. And then uh, we're talking with Chris as well about uh, using the IPG7, which is the line from Barcelona. Right. Um, I reached out to uh, Angel as well about getting these cells without knowing that you guys are already talking in, in parallel. So anyway, I'm sure we'll be able to get our hands probably also in Toronto on these cells um, and, and test that as well. So maybe these two models here, as well as other things that Shabbat might, might want to share that could, uh, that could be used in Xenograph. That's great. So that's pretty much what have you can. Yeah. Have you tried freehand injection of the cells rather than stereotaxis? Because it's quicker, it's faster, and we, um, in our experience, we get more engraftment, and also we get less uh, of the mice because of the long term anesthesia. How long does it take to inject this out? Sorry, what, can you repeat that? Like how long does it How long does it take to do a stereotaxis injection? Oh, um, uh, maybe, I don't know, 10 minutes? Have you tried um, freehand injection? Yeah, yeah, this, um, this, is not, this is freehand actually. This is not controlled uh, electronically. Yeah, but without the stereotactic setup, just by doing it by hand? No, I haven't tried that, actually, but, you know, yeah. Okay. And how many cells are you injecting? I'm sorry if I missed that. Um, 100,000 cells. So I, I followed what the Stanford uh, people suggested, but now, as I said, I repeated also with the IPG21 injecting uh, 200,000, just in case, you know, there was not enough cells. You're right. So that that would be a good idea to inject more, especially for H3 ones. They tend to grow slower. So you can you can just max it up to two two hundred to two fifty. Okay, all right, that's good enough. And we can discuss offline if you want to do um um hand free injections. 
it's faster. It takes two seconds and you can inject. And if, in case, if you have mice that are dying because of the procedure, then we can discuss how we can do this without the stereotactic uh, setup. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> okay. Um, great, thanks. Uh, it's, it's encouraging that we're starting to see effects in phosphosmad in the ID1. So, you know, I mean, that's what we would expect to see with their inhibitors, and it's nice that, we're, that we are starting to see them, uh, see those effects. So, um, Alex, are, you're, all, you're all set. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I think we do have some more compounds to send to Alexi for Ripley 2 as well. Um, okay. We think our CO2 shortage in the UK is now getting perhaps better, so we'll, maybe we can ship those next week to you. <laughs> okay, so, um, I'll just summarize a few slides for uh, Ros and Ellie and then uh, hand over to Jong Su who can explain a bit more about our cell biology assays. On the crystallography front, we set up a bunch of compounds for ALK2, including some of the um, literature compounds. We screened those and we disappointingly only got diffraction to around four angstrom at best. Um, actually, that was your work, Ellie, wasn't it? No. Oh, okay, so um, we'll have to optimize those a bit more. Um, another difficulty with out too is our bacular virus for expression stopped working, um, so we're just regenerating the virus. Um, so that means probably won't be any more protein for the next three or four weeks. Um, but that'll pick up again once that's fixed. For ALK5, we've tried crystallizing 11 compounds setting up 56 crystal plates and got no hits whatsoever. Um, I have talked to a pharma company about out 5 crystallization and they said they had a batch that worked once at crystallization and they got a lot of structures and then they had it not work. Um, so it seems to be a bit hit and miss, but we're going to try some other constructs. Um, so that's been a bit frustrating. I'll probably reach out to some other labs who've done out 5 before. Next slide, Jeff. Okay. Um, as an orthogonal assay, we had done some thermal shift screening, and in this panel, we included the RIP K2 as well as the OUT2 and OUT5. So, Alexi, we'll ship off the RIP K2 data back to you um, for you to check. Um, but I'll, next slide, Jeff. Okay. Um, I think some of you may have seen this, but this is just a sort of correlating what we saw in TM shifts for OUT5 and OUT2. Um, so you see the vast majority of the M4K compounds appear somewhat out to selective. The dashed line is not in any strict thermodynamic sense accurate as a equipotent, but I think it's a reasonable uh, estimate from what we've seen. So um, can I ask a question, the Alexi? Um, so do you have any sense for correlation between this thermal shift data and uh, some of the more downstream, uh, for example, phosphosmad assays in the cells, is there a good correlation? Because, you know, for, as I mentioned, for RIP2, we really have some discrepancies. Yeah, we published that in the same paper as the LDN214117 paper. Mm -hmm. There's some correlation plots in there if you want to have a look. Okay. Okay. I mean, the, the more data, the, obviously the better the analysis. So one could, for example, take the nanobret assay or the phosphosmad and, and repeat those analyses and update the data. But um, for what we published, it's all a good correlation. Um, next slide. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Chong Fu, who just update you on some of the nanobret assays. Great. Hi, Jong Fu. Uh, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, so can I proceed to the next slide? So um, like a large chunk of the slides would be about uh, will be the results from the nanobread target uh, target engagement assay, and where I'm using a tracer and measuring the displacement of the tracer from um luciferase label um, SEVR1 protein, and so like the um, one part that, that is still missing for, for this essay is that um, I'm still not having the corresponding 
uh, nanobread target engagement for out five for the off target. So for now, um, I'll be just showing the results for uh, the potency towards out two. And um, for the more potent compound, I'll be repeating them soon uh, for the other uh, with the other uh, autologous assays, like uh, for the promoter assay and all for L5 of target effect. Okay. So uh, in this slide, uh, I'm I'm showing um, in black. Um, those are the results, uh, the previous results, just for the purpose of comparison. And in green are the compound, uh, the most recent compound compounds. And um, here I'm showing uh, the compounds that have been like modified at the core region, um, where the metal group that have been introduced and in increased the specificity towards out two, although it uh, decreased slightly the potency towards out two, but overall um, it increased the specificity to out towards out two compared to out five. So. Uh, among this compound, like various uh, modifications have been done, and among them, um, the new compound with the nitrogen, mm -hmm. um, um, it has a pretty good potency of twenty nanomolar. And um, however, the uh, the substitution with other groups, with the uh, amine group, and 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 the rest, they are they are not really they are actually decreasing the potency of the compound. So, um, very soon I'll be testing the um, IC50 of uh, M4K 2106 um, in terms of the phosphorylation of the protein as well as the promoter assay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to get a sense of the specificity as well. Because um, in the past, often time when the specific uh, when the potency increase, uh, it also um, towards out two, uh, the activity towards out five can sometimes be increased as well. So would be important to check. So can move on to the next slide. Um, here um, I'm summarizing a few compounds with um, the attempt to replace the trimethoxy group, and um, so in the in the re most recent batch, there are two of these compounds, but none of them seems to be uh, like giving good uh, IC50. So yeah, can move on to the next slide. And um, then there are some other compounds where um, we are trying to uh, replace the solvent site. You are trying to uh, introduce an ether group in the solvent site uh, group, and um, actually, one of them um, result in quite decent IC50 of 38 nanomolar and um, M4K2 uh, uh, 112. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, that's like a that's a comp um, improvement compared to the previous compound that are similar. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we yeah, the other um, actually reduce the potency. So I'll be testing that as well to check to determine the specificity. So we can move on the, to the next slide. And um, further modification, um, there are actually a few positive uh, modification which resulted in improved uh, potency or at least similar uh, potency. So. Um, Two eleven, uh, two one one seven, two one two seven, and two one one eight. And um, yeah. And I'll I'll be checking in um other essays to make sure to to determine the specificity as well. Great. And and there are uh, a few more modifications. And uh, over here. Um, two one two zero and two one two one, they have almost identical uh, IC fifty goes out to, and are, are these actually um like rotatable? 
I'm. I think structurally they are very similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're very similar. They're just subtle isomers of one another, right? Actually, I'm sorry. Can you go back to the previous slide for one second, if it's possible? So, so I noticed that, for example, two one one one, you've made the modification, right? And you had the nitrogen in that position as well. What what, what was this uh, dictated by? Was it the structures of modeling based or just? In other words, why are you modifying that position? Uh, this is just to see if we could block potential sites of metabolism. That was one of the kind of driving reasons. And the other thing was we just wanted to explore that chemical space just to see if mm -hmm. there was anything advantageous that could be captured. And did but nothing in particular exploratory. Well, I mean, so I'm talking about the one down below, the 2111? Yes, yeah. Yeah, this is essentially 2009 with N metal, right? This is oh, no, the I'm talking metal. about the one below. I don't know what the number is. Oh, this one. Right? Yeah. Yeah, oh, the flooring? Yeah. Yeah, so that was exactly just to potentially block sites of metabolism or just in general look at uh, an electronic effect. So just purely exploratory. Yeah. yeah. Did you notice anything positive about those types of changes in that position? Uh, oh, those two so far have been destructive, uh, primarily to the uh, cell-based activity. Both the nitrogen there and the fluorine right. uh, have not been beneficial. Okay, because it aligns al along the hinge, so I was kind of curious whether it picks up some interactions potentially. Right, right. Okay, I'm yeah, and uh, in, in this slide, I'm showing a few compounds where the trimetoxic group had been completely replaced. And uh, on the top um, is one of the compounds that gave somewhat of a decent IC50, and then which is uh, having complete replacement of the methoxy group. And um, in the latest batch of compound, there are three of them which uh, ha is having a complete replacement of the trimetoxic group. But um, except for uh, 3010, um, the rest are basically not uh, potent at all. And, and on, on the right, um, there are the uh, other modification to include amine linkers, but um, none of them produce um, potent compound towards up to. This is Alex, is it worth trying 310 with the methyl pyridine on the hinge binder, like putting the methyl back there, yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's one of our compounds, Alex, and and we've got some other plans. Having seen the result for that compound, there's some other things that we we want to plan around that area. As you'll see when I talk about my slides, yeah. yeah and you're up next, Sue. So. <laughs> okay, can move to the next slide. Yeah, and um, over here, um, there are a few uh, literature compounds. Um, the M4K 3008, 9, and 12, they are synthesized by Charles Rivers Lab by Seuss. And um, two of them have no, uh, show no inhibition at all, and the other um, is just very modest. And on the far left um, is a, a legacy, uh, old compound, LDN193189, which is uh, really potent. And yeah, just to have a um, like, how's the comparison to the very com potent compound? So we can move on to the next slide. Yeah, there's an oxygen missing in, this, in the structure, but it's, yeah. it's just inactive. It didn't want to affect the potency. <laughs> <laughs> well, next, I'll show um, like just actually one slide of uh, data with a uh, cellular. Um, Phosphoration of um, out to substrate in the cells, uh, which is like SMART 1 and 5. So, this is an example data with uh, M4K 3007 and 204, uh, 2040. And uh, in this essay, I'm stimulating the C2, C12 myoblast cells with BMP7, which activates the uh, uh, out 2. And after that, I'm fixing it with uh, formaldehyde. And staining it with a specific and uh, antibody that is 
specific towards um, phosphorylated SMART1 and 5. And after that, I'm um, quantifying the amount of phosphorylated SMART1 and 5 in the nuclei of the cells because the activated, um, the phosphorylated SMART1 and 5 will be translocated to the nu uh, cell nucleus. And I'm quantifying um, the signal in each and every single nuclei and taking the integrated um, fluorescent intensity and uh, getting the average value of for each uh, 96 well. And I'm like cons uh, constructing the IC50 curve from that. And I'm having um, no either no stimulation or no uh, primary antibody control to control for the specificity of the antibody. And can we okay, this is slide? tissue, right? Is this is the cells that we're looking at. Um, these are um, not the DIPG cells, unfortunately. But um, I can uh, I can modify the protocol to test sure. uh, the, to perform the same assay on the DIPG cells. But that would require okay, but it's a cell growing. Okay, great, great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. And um, over here, um, there are eight compounds that were basically most we are most interested in. And um, so in green are the um, IC50 measure uh, in, in this assay, and in black uh, are the previous nanobread um, IC50 values, just uh, for the purpose of comparison. And um, for most of the co compound, actually, um, the IC50 measure with the uh, phosphorylation of SMART15 is quite comparable to the nanobread uh, target engagement. But uh, except for uh, some compound like uh, 3003, 3007, where they had very low um, IC50 level uh, uh, value in the target engagement assay, but in comparison, the uh, phosphorylation of one, uh, SMART15 is actually not as low because for example um for two uh 1062 and 2009 um their value their, their, their value is actually quite comparable between the phosphor smart one five phosphorylation and nano bread uh not so much of of the, some of the very potent compound yeah and even the positive uh, control LDN 193189. So, because in the nano bread uh, target engagement essay, it had a single digit IC50. A different cell, a different assay. Yeah, true. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. But. Yeah, I guess but, you uh, might expect yeah. to see some changes uh, across different series with respect, but uh, overall, I think the data is pretty encouraging. And, and and actually, I'm quite optimistic that I will be getting the phosphor smart two three, which corresponds to the activation of ARC five soon. Um, uh, I I'm not able to show the result um in this meeting because um my experiment failed. Yeah, so I'm like further optimizing the assay because I've um found an antibody that worked, and ah, that is very right. specific for phosphor smart two three. Uh, yeah, which is um phosphorated by out 5 so that would give us a comparable assay to compare the specific uh to compare the selectivity of the different compounds i have a quick technical question um do you have a, a way to uh, normalize for any effect on cell growth or viability in this in this assay uh, for this particular phosphorylation assay uh, because the time frame is only um like 1 hour where I stimulate oh. the cells with the uh, the ligand, the BMP7. So, um, and I'm quantifying uh, based on the DAP nuclei counter staining with DAPI. I see. So, okay. Yeah. I didn't realize it was that short of a time frame. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm having a um, autologous assay where I'm measuring the uh, transcription, of the output of out to activation. Um, so. Like from this batch of assay, basically the compound with uh, below 100 nanomolar um, IC50 in the cells, I'll be repeating those, um, like in, in those different assays. I'll be, yeah. I missed it. What cells? What cells were you using? 
um, for this, I'm using for the phosphorylation of one uh, for, for smart one five. Um, I'm using um, C two C twelve myoblast. Whereas in the nano bread, I'm using um, hex cells. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, Zhang Fu. Okay. Great job. Um, okay, Sue, I think uh, you're up next. And again, I think you know we're catching up slowly, but uh, we are uh, a little behind schedule. Um, so. Okay. Okay, if you want to move on to the next slide then. Yeah. So this is just a general update on uh, progress that we've been making at Charles River. Uh, so we've uh, almost completed the original set of literature compounds and we've obviously now started to prepare some uh, new target compounds. And obviously we're, what we're trying to do is avoid the areas that, um, that are being actively pursued at the OICR. Um, ideally, um, We'd, we'd, ideally, we'd like some uh, results on the crystallization studies from some of the literature compounds. I know you're trying, um, but that will help us to confirm the binding mode, especially for compounds like uh, 3007, where it's not entirely clear where the cyclopropyl carbonyl sits in in the uh, pocket, because uh, it seems to, from our docking studies, it seems to sit right in a um, an area that's quite heavily, uh, it's got a lot of water, waters in there, so if we could understand exactly what, what happens, what happens there, then uh, it would help us, it would help us to understand um, the binding mode and be able to give us a better idea of how to generate some new ideas. Um, so SIP profiling we've completed on uh, five lead compounds and plasma protein and brain tissue bindings are ongoing. We've now got the plasma protein binding data on in mouse on five compounds. Um, the other data will be coming out late, hopefully later this week. Great. Next Great. slide, please. So these are just... Um, just summarizing the results from some of the, the literature compounds. So um, I've included 3007 on here. Uh, that one we discussed last time. Uh, 3008 is where um, we've removed the isoxy group on the piperidine ring on the left hand side. Um, 3013 is a urea. That compound has just been sent off. Uh, uh, today, I think. Um, unfortunately, we completed the synthesis and only had about two MIGs, so we're only going to be able to, we've only sent it for uh, the primary screening at RBC, so unfortunately there's not enough, enough of that compound. But if it looks really exciting, we'll, we can always go back and, um, and make some more. But as you can see, the results uh, are shown on here. 3007 of the compounds looks to be the most potent. Um, so Again, it would be interesting to understand what that ethoxy group is doing. Yeah. Uh, and, and also whether the pyridine nitrogen is important. So that's the literature compound. Next slide, please. So these are some recent results on some of the compounds um, that, you know, the novel targets. So um, first compound 3009, this was one of the original set that I think we. Uh, had agreed to make right at the beginning. Um, unfortunately, having that amine linker between the pyridine and the indazole seems to have completely killed all the activity. So I think this, the second compound in 3010, that's quite an interesting compound. Um, so it's been, replacing the indazole by a benzimidazole, I went back and looked at the data on the indazole that lacked the, um, the methoxy group, and that was considerably uh, less active than, than this compound. So you're almost directly comparing it with the compound with the, the indazole with the methoxy, which is shown at the bottom there, 1188, which is about 50 nanomolar. So this is why I was saying uh, earlier that I think we've got some plans to make some more compounds around that area. Um, the third compound, 3011, that compound is where we've put we've incorporated a second nitrogen. So sort of comparing that with 1210 shown at the bottom where, where you've got the 
always get me, me uh, heterocycles. So that one's a pyrazine. The other one's the one that we've made is the pyridazine. Um, the pyridazine is uh, considerably less active than the pyrazine. And this uh, hydroxyethyl pyrazole is the, is the other compound that's being shipped this week. Great. It'll be interesting to see that the results on that. Next slide, please. So talking about new targets. So here I'm showing what I was talking about with the benzimidazole. So M4K1126 there was about 517, 517 nanomolar in the primary assay. That's just got the indazole. Moving one of the nitrogens around to have benzimidazole, potencies come down to 150 nanomolar. So I think there are quite a number of things that we can do uh, shown in the box on the bottom. So that's just purely uh, modifying the actual um, benzimidazole, moving the benzimidazole around, but also in obviously incorporating the methyl in the four group, four position of the pyridine. Um, I think they're important compounds to make. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, so here we're talking about alternatives to that 4-methyl compound. Obviously, you all know that 2009 is an interesting compound. So we've started making compounds of the type in the yellow box at the top. Um, so replacing the methyl effectively by a carbonyl. Um, in order to do that, we've in included another nitrogen in the ring. So you're actually linking through a nitrogen rather than through a carbon. Um, so, say synthesis of those compounds has been initiated, and the compounds at the bo bottom in the blue box with the pyridone. Um, so the uh, the Novartis, sorry, the Merck compound had a pyridone at the hinge. So I think it would be um, interesting to see. We, we've had the amino pyridine, we've had methyl pyridine, uh, but we've never made a compound with a pyridone in there. So we've just started synthesis of those two. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so some other ideas. So I think I, I suggested that last time the compound on the far left. So rather than linking directly through the three position of the pyridine, attaching to the four position and using a linker puts that aromatic ring in a sim similar sort of position. Um, and uh, we haven't actually started the synthesis of these compounds yet, but uh, we're hoping to be able to do so fairly soon. Um, but some other ideas were in some of the literature compounds we've been um, preparing, we've had a non-aromatic ring in that region. So thinking that if you could link a, through a carbonyl to a non-aromatic hetero, heterocycle and put appropriate substitutions on there, and on the right-hand side you can see some docking of either the methoxy preparatory the pyridine amides or the um, uh, pyrrolidine type compounds. And you can see that um, from the docking picture that the, the carbonyl, appear, carbonyl, that's carbonyl, yes, uh, seems to have a water-mediated water interaction through to uh, the asparagine uh, 341. Um, so that could uh, be an interesting way of enhancing uh, the potency. And then the methoxy group interacts with them in the lysine pocket. And similarly, at the bottom, you can get similar sorts of poses with the five-membered ring. And in this case, we've got an amide on the um, on the pyrrolidine. So there's, I think there's some interesting uh, approaches there that we we could probably make relatively. The chemistry should, in theory, we haven't tried it yet, but could be relatively straightforward. Great, looks interesting, yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so just to uh, run very quickly through some of the ADME data that has been run at Charles River. So we put five compounds through the uh, seven SIP isoform um, at 10 micromolar. And 10 micromolar, yeah. Um, and we saw virtually no inhibition. So there was, um, no, there were actually 50, sorry, my, my, my mistake. We were originally going to do 10 micromolar, but we put it through uh, IC50s, and a, one or two of them showed a, a, a smidge of activity at sort of 20, ten, between 10 and 20 micromolar, but there was nothing that was active at less than 10 micromolar. So I think all of these compounds look ple pretty clean on the, on, the, on the SIPs, which is really pleasing. 
So next, yes, thank you. So plasma protein binding, uh, so again, five compounds. It's not actually quite the same five because we moved on between when we did the SIP data and when we did the plasma protein binding. So we've got slightly different set of uh, compounds. So the five compounds here, shown here, so the, uh, the two that are quite highly, relatively highly bound are 1062 and 2045. Um, on the more positive side, 2009 is the lowest, has the lowest uh, plasma protein binding. These are mouse results, and as I mentioned at the beginning, the um, human plasma protein binding and the brain tissue binding is ongoing, and we should hope to get that data out very soon to you. So the effect that that has on the PK profile is shown in the next slide where we've actually, so I, I took the, the PK profiles, because um, just to remind people what they look like. Um, so for 1062, first of all, the, the, you can see the PK profile on the left-hand side. So looking at now taking into account the, uh, the plasma protein binding, the un unbound plasma concentration C max after oral dosing at 10 mg per kg is only 24 nanomolar. So you never actually achieve uh, the cell base that what even the nanobrat cell base EC50 at that dose. So the chances of that compound giving um, much in the way of efficacy at that particular 10 mg per kg is quite unlikely. So we've got three compounds and that, that's the poorest one. The next one, 2045, is a little bit better. So taking the unbound plasma concentration um, after dosing at 10 mg per kg, the Cmax is around 99 nanomolar. Um, the 2009 is the most interesting one. That's not sorry. sorry 2009. That's right. So the unbound, <laughs> excuse me, uh, the unbound plasma concentration after oral dosing is around 500 odd nanomolar. Which, if you take the EC50 and the nanobrat of 57 nanomolar, or the phospho SMAD EC50 was I just took off the slides earlier was 78 nanomolar. So we're exceeding that uh, for well out into the uh, into the. So roughly out to about eight hours, we exceed the nanobrat EC50. Obviously, these are not using the EC50s in the uh, DIP, DIPG cell uh, lines, but at least it gives us an indication that we've got a much better chance of seeing efficacy with a compound of this type, with that sort of PK profile and the much lower protein binding, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, the, what okay. the fact would that have on the blood-brain barrier okay, so I've got that in my presentation if we get a chance yeah. to get to it. Uh, That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so obviously brain tissue binding will also be relevant um, right. because if they're different, then you know, so, sometimes you can get higher brain tissue binding, sometimes you get lower brain tissue binding, um, and that can actually influence what the relative amounts of compound is, is going to stay in the brain or be available in the brain. But we don't have that data yet. So, you um, the of the two amino uh, without the methyl group, I just we never. I don't think we, we ever looked at the protein no. binding. We no, don't have we that data. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 So this was just a, a suggestion that um, talking to our in vivo colleagues. Um, so we we. Certainly had some concerns that on serial bleeding eight time points out of a mouse um, by the end of the time period, there's a fairly good chance that there's not very much blood left in that mouse, and it's you know our in vivo guys would not actually do that. Um, so we had a, a suggestion that we, if you wanted to come to Charles River and do the the PK, you could serial bleed. Uh, four mice, sorry, three three mice, four time points, and then do another three mice with four time points, and and um, to maximise the cost efficiency, you could also do a set of six mice with two time points with terminal plasma and brain, um, and this would be a, a sort of an outline of the protocol that we could propose if that's if something that you want to do. Um, to, I, I leave that for probably discussions offline, but just to outline how we could we could help out with PKs. 
Yeah, no, I, you know, I think this is something we should talk about uh, offline a little bit too. Yeah. I think, uh, you yeah. know, we'll need to, again, look at budget, look at everything and, and data comparability and stuff. So, I mean, yeah. uh, I like this, but, you know, let's, let's think a little bit more about it and uh, we'll, we'll cool. try to schedule a call. Yeah, that would yeah, be good. Okay. Thanks, Sue. All right. Now we have uh, David. Yeah. Okay, so this is going to be uh, David McLeod speaking, and uh, unfortunately, this will be hopefully not the last meeting David attends, but the, probably the last one that he will present any new chemistry for, because he is leaving. He's uh, moving, uh, moving labs. David was a postdoc in our labs you know, for the past year and a half, two years almost, and uh, he's taken a position uh, with Professor Jorgensen in Denmark. And, uh, you know, we want to thank David for all of his hard work on this project and the other ones that he's been involved with. And, uh, you know, all the, wish you all the best in the future. And we look forward to your last presentation here. Perfect. So we're at about the six months mark in terms of compound shipment. Um, since we've been sending them to RBC and to Alex and, and Zhong, uh, Zhong Fu at RBC Group. Um, so this will just be a quick synopsis of a lot of the data uh, that we generate on pertinent compounds, as well as uh, a few of the more confounding effects we've been seeing um, in our attempt to replace or modify the, the trimethoxy arrow group. Um, so the first two compounds were part of uh, 1062 and 1055 were part of the 30 compound legacy set we had screened. Uh, we tested against relevant mutants as well at RBC and they showed good correlation. Uh, the G328V, which was uh, Jerome's uh, DIPG cell line 4, which he said was the most aggressive, um, was also the weakest effect that we saw um, of all the mutants uh, compared to the wild type ALK2 uh, in the RBC panel. Uh, the 1055 was our initial lead, as Jeff showed, um, the outline of the project at the beginning. Um, it had reasonable potency there, but when we screened it at RBC, uh, it was much weaker, and the cell activity as a result was also not nearly as good with the methyl group at the two position. So we quickly moved away from that and started using 1062, the naked scaffold, um, as our base. One of the first analogs synthesized was 2009. Uh, this gave a slight increase in the potency, although reasonably similar, but Importantly, the cell activity window opened up between ALK5, um, and we got really good uh, cell activity and uh, potency on the nanobread assay. 1071, where the normethoxy compound uh, shows really good biochemical activity and uh, really, really good cell activity against ALK4 and ALK5, um, but that doesn't reproduce in any of the nanobread results we see above 200 micro, or nanomolar uh, in each case. Um, but the ALK5 DLA looks promising. So I don't know if it's a cell permeability issue or if there's some sort of disconnect there, but that's one of the more confounding uh, results we've seen. So you we want to look at this a little bit. Um, do you monitor the log B of some of those changes? Yeah, they're know? all basically yeah. very similar. Um, 1071, is we made a few analogs just to see if we were interested in that uh, selectivity window that it seemed to open up. Um, 2059 uh, shows the same similar sort of biochemical potency, although usually the methyl group in the four position has helped increase potency slightly. In this case, it actually erodes selectivity, and we uh, erode the, the potency in the nanobread assay as well. Adding the fluorine to the middle, instead of hydrogen, increases the potency. Um, but again, we don't see uh, the potency in the cell-based assays hovering around 65 to 100 nanomolar. Um, but the cell activity uh, between ALK5 and ALK2 is eroded by that fluorine there. Uh, head group uh, replacement of the trimethoxyaryl has been a little bit uh, challenging. Most of those have resulted in uh, deleterious or erosion of cell, uh, potency to the point that they're not active at all. Um, we played around a lot 
similar to what you showed, Alexi, with uh, different substitution patterns and sulfonamides and all of those compounds, um, if they weren't dead, were pretty close to it in the cell-based assays. Um, the only success we've had is with some of these fluoroamides, um, which have shown reasonable cell-based activities, though um, pretty low cell activities between ALK5 and ALK2. Um, we've also studied uh, some of the piperazine, modifications of the piperazine group on the south, um, adding some extra flexibility with uh, the ether linkage. Uh, with a piperidine shows uh, okay potency in the same kind of range, slight increase in some cases. Um, and here, if you look at 1134 compared to 2046, we can see that uh, swings in the biochemical potency can really swing um, the selectivity that we see observed out of the assays. Um, we can't really point to any specific reason that a small change in just this methyl group would lead to such a substantial. Uh, so I see there's also the uh, the methyl, but it's a really big, big swing there. Um, 2043, 2044, and 2045, we got the full PK done, and they all looked really good, um, no issues. Um, other piperazine modifications, We've been looking at um, 2009 compared to some of these analogs here where we've input a double bond in or methylated. Uh, the methylation at the terminal nitrogen there seemed to increase clearance on our PK results. But selectivities look good and potencies are all very similar. Uh, different substitution patterns. Uh, 1134 going to 2107, we see a decrease in potency um, on the nanobret as well as the biochemical. Aryl modifications, the chloro right next to uh, the central pyridine seems to have a really good effect increasing selectivity uh, as well as decreasing or increasing the potency. Um, biochemically, as well as in the cell-based, we're getting down uh, under 50, around 50 uh, nanomolar. And these tetrahydroequinolins series that we've been working on uh, show really good biochemical potency, which translates nicely to sub-20 nanomolar in the cell. Uh, we have been <laughs> pretty fresh results, so we haven't had a chance to do any follow-up in terms of PK. Um, they're a little bit worse in terms of a rapid PK screen, but um, we'll have to discuss uh, compound progression for these ones a little bit further. Uh, aromatization of those rings uh, leads to a decrease in the potency, and especially in the cell-based potency. Um, not so much in the biochemical, but a large decrease in the nanobread. Some of the work that we're pursuing currently uh, substitution of the benzylic piperidine uh, with fluorohydroxy and methoxy, similar to the 3007 blueprint patent compounds, um, as well as some, uh, similar to the chloro, some ether substitution uh, next to the central pyridine ring. We also have looked at a number of core substitutions. So based off of the central methyl, we've looked at amino methoxy and nitrile, um, with the nitrile being especially uh, beneficial, whereas pumping extra electron density into the hinge, which was the initial thought process to strengthen that interaction with the hinge binder uh, residues, uh, has actually led to a decrease in potency, both biochemical and cell-based. Um, we have some other uh, ones planned, uh, so we have the benzyl alcohol and the uh, formal group here, as well as uh, the cyclopropyl ethyl and alkyne, uh, as well as CF3, all in order. Um, so those will be made, and maybe we can even uh, look at how the electronics 
and sterics of that position affect uh, the interaction with HingeBinder, put out like a small publication or something. I haven't seen that anywhere. Anyone study that kind of effect? So uh, we've been ruminating on the idea. Um, just a small communication. Um, if we look at 1062, the way it binds um, in the pocket, we see nice rotation of the rings. If we look at 2044, which Alex was uh, kind enough to get crystal structure of on L2, we see a very similar binding, uh, slightly more rotation in the trimethoxy aryl ring, um, but nothing too substantial. Um, it would be great if we could get 2009 crystallized both on ALK2 and ALK5 to try and see where that selectivity is coming from. Um, other than that, yeah. Perfect. Thanks, David. Thank you. Okay, so looks like we have just a couple of minutes left in the formal meeting. Um, I will go through mine as quickly as possible. Um, so hopefully anyone who can stay will. Um, so I, I wanted to just highlight the fact that we did send compounds to Formouse PK, and we talked about this at the last meeting, so I won't reiterate it, but really all of the compounds, 2009, 2043, and 2045, Showed, showed a pretty good overall PK profile. And so we ended up sending 1062, 2009, 2043, and 2045 for brain uh, exposure. Um, and what I'm showing that data here, so the brain exposure was an experiment in which we dosed 10 mg per kg orally and then looked at both plasma and brain exposure at two hours and at four hours. And so 1062, where we've got the hydrogen here, we see a ratio of about one. Uh, so it's getting across the blood-brain barrier really quite well. Uh, 2009, which is our, our lead compound where we've got freedom to operate, where you know we uh, uh, lo looks quite good, has a, a great PK profile overall, um, and it does get across the blood-brain barrier as well. We reach about five to six micromolar in the brain at two hours. Um, the plasma exposure in this experiment was a little bit higher than what we had seen in the just the, the PK experiment. And so the ratios here are a little bit lower than perhaps we'd like to see, but still I think the, the overall concentrations are, are quite good and it's, it's a reasonable uh, penetration into the brain. 2043 did not get across the blood-brain barrier very well. It, it uh, showed efflux in our KCO2 assay and you know, we think that that might be predictive, and so we may test that in, uh, with a couple of other compounds to demonstrate it, but it looks like that, that might be the case. And 2045 as well, got across quite nicely with ratios of 1 and, and 0.5 at, at the 2 hours and 4 hours. So, uh, again, we're, we're getting compound into the brain, um, and, and, you know, I think we, we're generating some promising results. And, and 2009, I think, is still good enough to be able to continue on into uh, – proof of concept studies. We also profiled 2009 across the kinome at RBC. Uh, we tested it at one micromolar and we hit 10 out of 374 kinases at greater than 50%. Um, ABLE 1, you know, really, I mean, ALK 1, 2, and 6 were three of those, so we would expect to hit those uh, given the similarity. Um, DDR1 is also one that we hit pretty hard. Uh, this is uh, also implicated in childhood brain tumors, so I don't think that this is a, a major deal, but it's something that we'll need to, to follow up on and to continue to look at. The others, MENC, NLK, SICK, we don't hit that hard. Same with this MLTK. The TNIC was one as well that uh, the original compound 1055 also hit, and uh, something that, uh, again, I don't think that there's a, a lot known about this one. I need to, uh, to, to figure out, to look at that more carefully to see whether or not that's really an issue, but it does seem like, you know, this, this is a really quite clean kinase inhibitor uh, overall. So I, I think that bodes well. And if we compare 2009 versus our tar target product profile that I showed you at the beginning, uh, I don't have time to go through this in great detail, but basically we're doing quite well against the target product profile. And I think that we're a we should continue to profile 2009 as a potential candidate to be able to move forward while we continue to look for better compounds. Um, 
uh, I think David and, and Sue did a great job showing a promising new compound, so I won't uh, go there. But what I will highlight on uh, in the last minute is uh, con continue, continuing to profile M4K 2009 as a potential candidate. So we'll send it out for Herb, Ames, and uh, Sarah uh, uh, panel. We'll get IC50s for those 10 off-target uh, kinases at RBC. Uh, we'll evaluate uh, versus the panel of DIPG cell lines that, you know, we're starting to get data from Jerome and, and, and a variety of other uh, labs from around the world, hopefully, um, in vivo safety and efficacy. And this is something that I've been considering for a little while is that, you know, the DIPG007 model looks quite promising as a, as a potential model, but, you know, these compounds should actually be active in an FOP model as well that would show uh, potential safety issues. It could show, you know, PKPD effects, you know, and these models are actually pretty well validated. And so, you know, we might be able to just take a, a compound and at least make sure that it's getting in, doing what it should do in an FOP model. And, and then while we're optimizing and, and trying to figure out which, what's the best DIPG model to move these compounds into. So that might be a path forward and something that I think as a team we can discuss. Uh, we can Alex, if you're on the phone, if you have any thoughts on this right now, maybe we can talk later about it, but I know you're involved with the FOP projects. Yeah, we can take that offline. Okay. Yeah. Um, certainly, I think, you know, we saw some interesting uh, capabilities from Javad, and I think, you know, sending the compound to him uh, in his labs would be very interesting to, to look at how well it, it is getting into the ponds region, to look at, you know, some of his cell lines uh, as well. And I think, you know, now that we have, uh, you know, we are considering this as a potential candidate, we should do a more thorough IP analysis. Um, uh, so we know we have freedom to operate with respect to the two Harvard patents that uh, demonstrate specifically the classic compounds that we're looking at. Uh, but, you know, obviously the literature is much broader than that. So with this very specific compound, you know, perhaps we could do a more thorough analysis. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, likely. I don't think that's an issue. The thought about that is whether there's original claims that would enjoin you from progressing. You can get a selection patent and still be enjoined yeah. a founder patent. Yeah. Um, obviously, we want to continue pro profiling the new promising analogs, basically from the 2009 series. Uh, the ALK5 data is going to go a long way to try to help us determine what the selectivity of some of those newer compounds are and uh, obviously we want to continue the SAR to try to identify even better compounds than uh, than what we have now so um, with that uh, I went through my part as quick as I could um, you know I, I think that I, we probably stimulated a little bit of discuss you know items for potential discussion there maybe what we'll do is at the beginning of the next meeting We'll have a. We'll try to schedule a discussion uh, session to, uh, to to try to hash some of these things out. I think we have enough work and enough plans to do us for for the the coming month uh, without a substantial amount of, of of discussion. I mean, if anyone vehemently disagrees with 2000 moving 2009 forward into some of these studies, and uh, please you know let us know. But uh, you know, I, I think uh, it does meet most of the criteria that we've set out to achieve, and, and uh, I think it could be a very good first candidate, at least to demonstrate proof of concept. Is the, is the activity done at CAM, at RBC, to do one? It is not at CAM, no, right? Ten right. It's at 10 micromolar, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, some of those selectivity profiles, they want them at higher ATP concentration. It might be even better. Right, yeah, and even even the ALK5, you know, the data that we do have right now is 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 done in a luciferase-based assay where things tend to look a little bit more potent. So our, our our selectivity might actually our selectivity ratios might actually be better when we do end up with an an ALK5 um, assay from Pro, using the Promega approach, right? So yeah, it's a target, and all those are the targets that follow. Just follow, yeah, yeah, and you know, I mean, I think it, overall the compound looks really quite yeah, clean. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I think I think we're very happy with that. So, 
Um, yeah. Um, so with that, I think you know that that concludes another monthly up to meeting. When's the next meeting scheduled? The next meeting is scheduled, I believe, August eighteenth, sixteenth. I will double check that and make sure everyone knows. Uh, we also need to get uh, more meetings on the books. Uh, moving into, I think we have one for September booked already, but moving beyond that, we need to get those onto the calendar. And I'll work with Angela over the next little while to, to try to get those scheduled. So, um, yeah, and we may set up a subset meeting, seeing as how far. So, just from the overall plan, uh, we're, we're about, you know, three to six months, depending on your count, is ahead of where we had put down in the grant. Mm -hmm. you know? So, this is, this is really nice. Um, in no shape or form, though, moving to 2009 for as a potential candidate, we're going to stop any of the other work that's falling behind. No, 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 no. I mean, I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of that and that the property, the other analogs, et cetera, that the other, et cetera, everything else we're working on is, is just as important right now. I mean, it's, it's nice to have this one, but uh, I think everyone in, around here has been on drug discovery long enough to know that. Uh, there's a lot of other things still to go. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, it's yeah. nice to have this early, but let's see what else happens. Oh yeah, no, I think actually, you know, some of the compounds that were presented today, there, there's some interesting compounds there as well that need to be further profiled to be able to to really determine. Um, yeah. You know, but I think something could catch 2009, but you know, I think let's move it forward while we can mm -hmm. until we find out what makes us stop, right? Yeah. <laughs> When you happen to Freedom Incorporate and do a name, maybe like some of the nitro compounds, if you didn't include those ones. The, the nitro one? Yeah, some of the nitro compounds. Yeah. Include in this list. yeah. Or even a broader look at that position. Right, right yeah. 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 Exactly, yeah. And even yeah. The at that four pyridyl position. Because that was really the differentiator with the, the Harvard patent, was having a substitution. It's not hydrogen at that yeah. four position on the period over it. So, yeah, good idea. Yeah. Next meeting is on 15th of August. 15th of August, yeah. It was, I knew it was between, it's somewhere in there again because I'm going on vacation again. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so thanks everyone for those who were able to stick around and yeah. thanks uh, really for all the great presentations. We'll make Thank sure that these are fine. And uh, we'll be in touch with everyone soon. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Bye.